All right, how we doing tonight? Everybody good? Who all got Chick-fil-A? Everybody got? Okay, cool. Ben, yeah, throw it up here. No, I'm just kidding. I don't, I don't need it. I don't need it, man. I don't need it. Hey, y'all turn with me to Luke chapter 14 tonight. Luke chapter 14. Uh, it is so good to be here. I am so thankful for Pastor Eric uh, for allowing me to come up here and uh, be able to share with you guys tonight. Um, we're starting a new series tonight called We Love Our Students, right? We love our students. And I've been thinking about the, the, the series title, kind of what this is uh, trying to communicate. And uh, it is one thing to stand up here and to tell you guys that we, we love you and, and to try and communicate that with our mouth. But we also, uh, whether it's middle school, high school, college, uh, whatever it is, we want to communicate with the way uh, we act, the things that we do. We want to communicate that we love our students. We really do. And, and the, the cliche, I guess, uh, that we often hear is that love is a verb, right? Love acts. Love does. Love gives. Love helps. And so what I want to do tonight is I want to come alongside you guys and, and teach you from the scripture what it looks like to be a disciple and to, to follow Christ. Because here, here's what I believe. I believe the best way for us to show our love for you is to teach you how to love Jesus. It's the greatest thing we can do in, in, in loving you is to display Christ and to point you to the scripture and see in the scripture how to love Jesus and to love Jesus well. I've got, um, I've, I've got these two girls at the house, my, my daughters, one's five, one's two, and those ages are important with what I'm about to tell you. Uh, this past weekend, uh, it, it was pretty funny, my, my wife uh, went on this trip with some friends, she went down to Savannah, Georgia, and uh, I was home alone, uh, single dad for the weekend, and uh, I, I love those weekends, it's, it's pretty fun to hang out with my girls together, but uh, Saturday night we were eating, and it was our third meal in a row eating pizza, uh, which, which is what happens when mom leaves, right? Pizza is easy, the kids love it, and health goes out the window when mom leaves. So the fun dip breaks out of the drawers, uh, the cereal, the pizza, the sodas, the ice cream, like it all comes back. And so the girls are sick when my wife gets back. Uh, so, so we're sitting down for dinner on Saturday night. And we're eating pizza. And one thing that we really love in our house is milk. Anybody, any milk lovers in the house? So, so my kids love milk. My kids love milk. And it, it's, it's all kinds of milk. We've got every kind of milk you can possibly think of in our refrigerator. We've got coconut milk, 2%. We've got silk. We've got, we've got it all. We've got the syrups, the strawberry, the chocolate. Like, we've got it all. And we ran completely out of milk on Saturday night. And when we run out of milk in our house, it's a crisis. Like, it's an emergency. And so we're, we're eating dinner. I, I realize we're out of milk. And so I turned to my five-year-old daughter and I said, hey, watch your sister. I'm going to run up to Publix and get some milk. And I, I'm obviously joking. I mean, y'all don't really think I'm going to do that. But I walk out of the house and I shut the door. And I stand by the door with my ear up to it for like a minute. Now, when you're in shock, a minute is like a really, really long time. And so I'm standing there at the front door. And after about a minute, I open the door and I walk back in. And no lie, my five-year-old is sitting at the table. My two-year-old is right there next to her. My five-year-old's like... Uh -oh. And my two-year-old is like... like what, what do we do, right? Like, what, what kind of love would that be as a father to my daughter to walk out and just say, hey, you've got it. <laughs> Fend for yourself. Like, you're on your own. You can handle this. You can do it. Figure it out. Like, what kind of love would that be? No, that's, that's not what we want, right? That's not what love is. Love comes alongside. Love protects. Love gives. Love helps. Love acts. Like, I want to I be in my kids' lives. I want to nurture them. I want to raise them up. If I want my daughter to, be a, to grow up to be a, a follower of Christ, someone who loves Jesus, then I want to walk with her throughout her life so that she can become that. 
And that's what we want to do as, as pastors and staff and all the leaders, uh, the leadership in this room. Like we want to come alongside students and we want to show our love for you by pointing you to the scripture and modeling for you what, what it looks like to follow Jesus. So when we look at the scripture and, and we see the command of Jesus over and over, we see Jesus calling his disciples to, to follow after him. We see it in, in Matthew where Jesus says, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. We, we see Jesus bringing his disciples under his wing and pouring into their life. When we see Jesus command his disciples to, to go and make more disciples in Matthew chapter 28, where he says, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. When we see those commands, like we, we want you as well as us, ourselves, we want to be obedient to God's word. And so tonight, what I want to do is I want us to look at what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. What does it look like to be a follower of Jesus? Because if we want to obey Jesus' commands to make disciples, we cannot do that if we don't know what a disciple is. Let me say that again. We cannot make disciples if we don't know what a disciple is. Like, if you want to learn business, don't come to me to learn business. I've never run a business. I've never taken business classes. I don't know the first thing about it. I wouldn't be the, the best person. If you want to learn golf, do not come to me to learn golf. Like, my goal in golf is not to lose a pack of 50. Like, that, that's it. So if you want to learn from me, like, you, you can't... You, you're not going to learn golf. <laughs> like, I can't teach you what I don't know how to do. And so if Jesus calls us to go make disciples, I, I want you to hear this. You cannot replicate what you are not living. You can't multiply yourself as a follower of Jesus if you aren't a follower of Jesus. And so tonight we're going to look at a very uh, difficult passage in the scripture, and I want us to see what it means to be a devoted follower of Jesus Christ. And so let's read this in Luke chapter 14, starting in verse 25, and going to verse 35. It says, now great crowds were traveling with him. So he turned and he said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, and yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you wanting to build a tower doesn't first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, after he has laid the foundation and cannot finish it, all the onlookers will begin to ridicule him, saying, this man started to build and wasn't able to finish. Or what king, going to war against another king, will not first sit down and decide if he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If not, while the other is still far off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. In the same way, therefore, every one of you who does not renounce all his possessions cannot be my disciple. Now, salt is good, but if salt should lose its taste, how will it be made salty? It isn't fit for the soil or for the manure pile. They throw it out and let anyone who has ears to hear, let him listen. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you so much for your word. God, I pray that you would teach us tonight. God, teach us what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus so that we can know you, so that we can follow you as you have asked us to, and God, so that we can replicate ourselves. God, we want to obey your word. We want to be disciples who make disciples. So God, teach us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. 
So Jesus is walking in this passage, and he's got this large crowd following after him. Like, place yourself in this crowd. He's walking, this crowd is following after him, and he turns around and he says some words that are uh, very um, offensive to people. Like if you're trying to create a movement, if you're trying to create growth in a ministry, you don't want to turn around and say the words that Jesus just said. But it's interesting because Jesus turns around and he says these words, and he offends these people, and it's, it, it doesn't really matter to him. Like, he speaks truth, and he wants these people to know what it really is going to cost if they are going to be devoted followers of him. Because, see, there were many of those who were following after Jesus in this moment, and they were following him geographically, but they were not following his life. From the outside looking in, you would have seen these people who were walking behind Jesus, and you would have thought, man, these are, these are true believers, these are true followers, and in reality, when we hear the words of Jesus, most likely these were not real followers, and these people would have walked away from Jesus after he said what he said. And I wonder tonight, as we sit in this room, how many of us may, on the outside, looking in, you look like a follower of Jesus, but in all reality, if you were to take a deep look at your heart, if you were to examine your own life tonight, maybe, just maybe, you're not really following Jesus because what he says in this word is a very difficult path, and we must count the cost of what it looks like to follow after him. So Jesus turns around, and he says some things. He says some things, and and I want you to understand this. These are not recommendations that Jesus says here. These are requirements. He says, if you do not do these things, you cannot be my disciple. If you don't do this word, if you don't follow my direction here, you cannot follow me. They're not recommendations. They they are absolute requirements. And he speaks this truth, even though it may have offended and pushed away some. So let me just pause right there and let let me say this. A lot of times Christians, especially, like I've been where you are. Listen, I've been to high school. I've been to college. Like I understand some of the fears that we have in sharing the gospel. And one of the major fears is rejection. One of the major fears is that we're going to offend some friends of ours. And, and I just want to say this with, with as much humility as I can tonight. Listen, I would rather speak truth to a friend, family member, or neighbor and have them reject that truth than be quiet and help usher them into hell simply because I'm fearful of what they're going to think about the truth. Man, my prayer for all of us in this room, like, you want to see a movement? Imagine the students in this room who are followers of Jesus getting passionate about the gospel and saying, it doesn't matter what we do, we are going to advance the gospel. We are going to tell as many people as possible what Jesus says, who Jesus is. We're going to tell them about the death and resurrection of Christ because that gospel is life-giving and it means eternity for people. Man, would we take the truth of the gospel and give it to other people? Robbie Gallaty says, listen, the gospel came to you as it was heading to someone else. Why, why so often as Christians do we accept Christ, we follow Jesus, we, we take the gospel for ourselves, and then it stops with us? We don't pass it along. Like the gospel was meant to come to us so that we could take it to others. We are meant to, we are created to flourish in in Christ so that we can help others flourish as well. So here's what Jesus says. Incredible, incredible words. It says, now these great crowds were traveling with him, and so he turned to them and he said this, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father, hate his own mother, wife, and children, 
brothers and sisters, he cannot be my disciple. What does that mean? <laughs> like, if I'm reading that in quiet time, I'm like, what do I, what do I do? <laughs> what do I do with that? <laughs> like, Jesus, do you really mean that? Like, I, I thought we're supposed to love people. I thought, I thought the whole point of following Jesus was love and, and to, to, to carry out grace and forgiveness towards other people. Like, what does this mean? <laughs> like, I, I love my family. I love my brothers. I, I love my mom and my dad. Like, how could Jesus look at these people who were following after him and say these words? I mean, that word hate, when it's directed towards people, makes me cringe. I mean, it's, it sounds so, like, vile towards people. One morning, my, uh, my wife and I were up, we were talking and we're trying to teach my, my oldest daughter, like, when, when we're having a conversation, like, don't interrupt us. Because she's always like, mom, 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 dad, 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 dad. And so she comes in the room, mom and I are talking, and she comes in and she's like, hey, dad. Hey, dad. Hey, dad. And so finally I'm like, hey, hold on one second. One second, right? And I turn my attention back to my wife, and we're talking, and she's like, mom. Mom, mom, like she's switching back and forth, like who's going to give me attention right now? And I said, Maddie, that's enough. Stop. We're trying to have a conversation, like wait till we're done and then we'll talk with you. And she turns around, she goes, I hate you. And like ran out. And dude, I'm telling you, like my heart stopped. Like it, I, 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 I hate when people use that word, right? I, I, I don't like it when people say that they hate me, right? I, I want to I be liked. But it, it especially hurts when it's my own blood, right? It, it's my own daughter coming in and saying, Daddy, I, I hate you. And so I had to go back to her and be like, hey, you didn't really mean that, did you? <laughs> like, you don't really hate me, do you? And, and, we, and we got it straight. But man, that word, it, it just, it'll make you cringe. And for Jesus to stand here in front of these people and to look at them in the eye and say, if you are going to be my disciple, you've got to hate your mother and your father, your wife, your kids. And what is he saying here? Let me point you to a couple of other passages. Uh, Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, it says this, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Right? So, so Jesus is commanding us in Matthew, like, if you will love God with everything that is within you, all your thoughts, all your emotions, all your actions, everything that drives you, if you will love and, and devote yourself to him, it will flow into love for everyone else. It'll flow into love for your mom and dad, love for your children, love for your friends and neighbors and everyone else. And so is Jesus contradicting himself when he says you've got to hate your mom and dad, your wife and kids? Like, is, is he saying is he contradicting other places in Scripture where he says to love? That the greatest commandment is to love him, and the second is to love your neighbor. And the answer to that is absolutely not. The Bible doesn't contradict itself. So, so let's see, what, what is Jesus talking about here in this passage? Matthew chapter 10, verse 37, uh, is kind of the, uh, the Matthew's version of this text. And it says, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So when Jesus says, you've got to hate your mother and father if you're going to be my disciple, he's simply saying that, that you need to love him superior than anybody else. He's talking about a lesser love for your loved ones than you have for him. And so when he says, he uses this word, hatred, here's what he means. He means this, I want you to love me and be devoted to me so much so that all other love in your life looks like hate in comparison to the way you love me. 
What an incredible command. If you are going to follow after me and if you like you can you can walk behind me all you want to you can listen to my stories you can listen to uh, my preaching all you want you can watch what I do and all of that but if you do not love me far superior than anyone else in your life you cannot be my disciple you've got to put me first and foremost like I am it you've got to love me more More than your mom and dad. More than your brothers. More than your boyfriend or girlfriend. Like, you have got to put me first. Like, there's reason. There is reason to love Jesus far superior than anyone else. He is the only one, the only one who sustains you. You know, the Scripture tells us. The Scripture tells us that The reason we live and move and breathe is because Jesus Christ allows us to do so. The reason you take your next breath right now is because Jesus allowed you to take that breath. The moment that Jesus says, I want you to stop breathing, you will stop breathing. Jesus is, he is the authority over all. He is all powerful. He is over us. He is in control of all things. Therefore, therefore, we must love him and, and treat him in such a way that we love him. So what does that look like, man? That means, that means that we may have to give up some time to be with him, to know him. Man, to be disciplined in our life, to, to be with him. How can you love somebody far superior than anyone else, and not spend any time with them. It makes, it makes zero sense. Like, it would be a hard sell for me to tell my wife that I love her, but I'm not going to see you again for three months. Yeah, exactly. Like, it's not going to go over too well, right? Like, there's got to be a, a daily love for each other. There's, there, there's got to be communication. And the same is true with Christ. Like if we are going to love him more than anyone else, we've got to spend time with him. But then he goes further. He goes further. He says this. Verse 27. Or let's go back to verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So now he turns the attention to you. First of all, he says, if you want to be my disciple, you've got to love me more than anyone else. And now he turns the attention to you. And this is the toughest one. He turns the attention to your heart, your life. And he says, you have got to love me way more than you love yourself. You've got to hate yourself. And then he goes a step further and he says, I want you to pick up your cross daily and follow me. If you don't do that, if you're not willing to do that, you cannot be my disciple. And so what does he mean by that when he says pick up your cross? Um, The only time, the only time that people would pick up their cross was when criminals were headed to their death. The cross represents this instrument of death, of crucifixion. And so Jesus is turning to his disciples, or turning to these people following him, and he says, if you're not willing to die to yourself, humble yourself, and put me before yourself, and put others before yourself, you cannot be my disciple. When I hear this verse, I think about Jesus at the cross. You remember Jesus when he goes before Pilate, and they, they beat him almost to death? They stick this crown of thorns on his head. And then if that wasn't enough, they make Jesus carry his own cross. And we see a picture of this in the scripture. I mean, imagine this man who's broken and bleeding. He had been spit upon and mocked, ridiculed. He's got people screaming for his death. And on top of all of that, they make him carry his own cross. 
And it's gruesome to think about. It's gruesome to talk about. But, but when you look at the Scripture from a bird's eye view, that picture of Jesus carrying his own cross is a picture of love and grace for all of us. And so when Jesus says, if you want to be my disciples, you've got to take up your cross, it's a picture pointing to his death on the cross. He's saying, he's saying, I want you, just like I did, I want you to put others before yourself. Like Jesus on the cross is a picture of Christ for the world, Christ for the nations, Christ for the sinner. And so for you to pick up your cross and to follow after him is for you to say, man, I am going to be about others. I'm going to be about the nations. I'm going to be about the broken. I'm going to be about the poor. I'm going to be about the unpopular. I'm going to be about those who are mocked and ridiculed. I'm going to love on them and I'm going to take care of them because that is a picture of Christ. I want to take up my cross. I want to think of myself less And I want to love others more because I love Christ first and my love for Christ is affecting the way that I love and reach and serve and love on others. And then, and then you can be his disciple. If you're not willing to do that, you cannot be his disciple. And so think about this picture. Christianity is so much more than a lust-filled, gossip-saturated, flesh-driven, come to church and act like everything is cool kind of life. Christian is, Christianity, following Jesus, being a disciple, is much more than a once-a-year spiritual high at beach camp. It's much more than a mission trip. It's much more than wearing a cross necklace. It's much more than some Christian post on Instagram and Twitter. Christianity is about taking up your cross on a daily basis, humbling yourself and loving others more than you love yourself. And this is so difficult in our culture. So difficult in our culture. Why? Because we have a self-driven culture. We have a culture that says, look at me, look at me, look at me. I think about uh, when, when you watch like NBA games on TV or college football games and the camera goes to the crowd, right? And as it's zooming across the crowd, like everybody's trying to push everybody else out of the way so that they can get their 10 seconds of fame. And they're like, number one, right? You, you've seen that, right? Like, that's, that's what I feel like our culture is like. We're, we're trying to push everybody out of the way so that we can be first. So that people can look at us and see us and love on us. Our culture says, be what you want, be who you want, do what you want to do. And Jesus says, no, it's not about you. Life is about way more than you. Life is not about your passions. It's not about your selfish ambitions, your self-comfort, your self-centered planning, your self-saturating desires. It's not about any of that. It's about Christ and Christ alone. It's about his death on the cross, which allows you to follow after him and be made whole and be made new and have life everlasting in him. It's about following Jesus and taking up your cross and thinking of others more. Philippians 2 says, consider others more, more significant than yourself. Like that's, that's what following Jesus is about. It's, it's following in his footsteps. Changing our mindset from our own desires to Christ-centered desires. Christ-centered passions, asking him, man, God, what do you want for us? So he says, love me more than everybody else. Love me more than you love yourself. And then he takes a moment and he says, consider the cost. Consider the cost. Look at verse 28. For which of you, wanting to build a tower, doesn't first sit down and calculate the cost? to see if it has enough to complete it. Otherwise, after he has laid the foundation and cannot finish, all the onlookers will begin to ridicule him, saying, this man started to build and wasn't able to finish. Or what king going to war against another king will not first sit down and decide if he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If not, while the, others, while the other is still far off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. In the same way, therefore... Everyone who does not renounce all his possessions cannot be my disciple. So Jesus says, I want you to really think about this. 
I want you to consider what it's going to cost you to follow me. Like we, we have to consider the cost of everything we do. Like if we're going to go on a vacation, we've got to sit down and plan it out. Like how many days is this going to take? Uh, how, much, how many days of work am I going to have to take off? Like, how much is this going to cost? What hotel are we going to stay in? We've got to think about all of that. When you, when you uh, are doing homework, you've got to consider the cost of, if I don't do this, what's going to happen? And oftentimes, like, I've been there. I, I know how you guys think. Like, if I don't do this homework, what, I do, what do I need to do on this test in order to get the right grade? <laughs> like, that's the way we think, Right? We're always considering the cost. Listen, when we followed Jesus, it's no different. We've got to consider what it's going to cost to follow him. And what it's going to cost up to this point is we've got to love Jesus more than we love others, and we've got to love Jesus more than we love ourselves. And finally, we've got to love Jesus more than we love our stuff. We've got to love Jesus more than we love our stuff. He says, every one of you who does not renounce all his possessions cannot be my disciple. Are we willing to give up everything in order to follow Jesus? What do we care most about in our life? One of the biggest excuses we've got for for not getting in the word and loving Jesus and following him and learning about him and growing in him is we don't have the time. We we say it all the time. I don't have time for that. I don't have time for that. I've got ball practice. I've got cheer. I've got band. I've got all of this stuff in my life. My, My life is so filled with stuff that I don't have time. And then what we do is we come home and we spend hours and hours and hours on a device that has zero eternal value in our life. Like, let, me, let me just encourage you with this for a second. Take one weekend and don't get on your phone and let me tell you, let, just, just take a look at how much time you don't have. You've got the time to be with Jesus. You, you have time. We need to set boundaries in our life. We've got we to set some boundaries in our life and, and make time to be intentional about being with Jesus and studying his word. Man, are we willing to give up our possessions? Jesus, Jesus didn't even have a place to live. It says he didn't have a place to live, a place to lay his head. I, w- I want you to hear a couple of passages about what it means to renounce all. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32 and 34, it says, Recall the former days when, after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Your greatest possession is not your home, it's not the clothes on your back, it's not food, it's not your iPhone, it's not your vehicle, it's none of that. Your greatest possession is Christ and Christ alone. He is it. He's greater than all of our stuff. Hebrews 11, 24, it says, By faith Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. Listen, renouncing everything that we have does not seem so bad when we realize that Jesus Christ is our reward. It is easy to give up things in our life when we see the power and the authority of Christ in our life. We see the impact that Christ can have on our life to move us, to motivate us into mission. So I'll close with verse 34. It says, salt is good, but if salt should lose its taste, how will it be made salty? 
in Matthew, it says you are the salt of the world. And if salt loses its saltiness, it has been made worthless. And so think about what Jesus is saying here. He's saying if you wanna follow me, you've gotta love me more than everybody else, love me more than yourself, love me more than your possessions, and when you do this, when you do this, you will be effective as the salt of the world. And so let me, let me just encourage you right here. If you are not following Jesus in his words in Luke 14, if you don't love him above all things and all people, then you are salt that has lost its saltiness. And if a disciple of Christ does not do what a disciple is called to do, it is considered worthless to the kingdom. And I, my, my prayer is that each one of us in this room who, who claim Christ and follow Jesus, that we would be salt that is effective for the advancement of the gospel in our schools, in uh, the jobs that we have. I see all of y'all at Chick-fil-A all the time working. Like, I know y'all work. So like, we want to be salt in our workplace. We want to be salt on our campuses. We want to be salt uh, in our neighborhoods. Like, we want to be salt that has an impact for the sake of the gospel. And so the question is, how are you doing as a disciple? Are you following Jesus the way he commands us to follow Jesus? Let's bow our heads. I want to pray for us tonight. The band's going to come back up. But I want the invitation tonight to, to, to be twofold. First of all, for those of you who, who claim Christ, you, you're a follower of Christ, maybe, maybe there's something in your life that you, that you love more than Jesus. Maybe there's somebody, some, something, maybe there's a sin in your life that you've elevated above Christ and, and you need to take care of that tonight. And, and so my invitation to you as a follower of Jesus is that you would come and repent that you would turn from those things that you have put above Christ, that you would re-elevate Christ as number one in your life, that he would be above all so that you can be a disciple who makes a difference. And then I want to throw this out there as well. I know with a room this size, there's some students in here, and maybe you've never made that decision to follow Jesus. You don't, you don't know Christ. You, you've heard about him maybe your whole life. You've come here tonight not really expecting much. And I want to tell you tonight that Jesus loves you. And I want to tell you that Jesus, even though you have come here tonight and there's brokenness in your life, there's sin in your life, sin that you... Uh, may have going on that you think has separated you so far from God that there's no hope, there's no answer. I'm telling you, Jesus will look into your heart tonight and he will say, I love you and I care for you and I want you to be my disciple. So in the midst of your brokenness tonight, know that God has given us hope. He's given us hope in his son, Jesus. And Jesus, Jesus came down and he lived a perfect life. He died on the cross as our perfect sacrifice and he rose from the dead so that we can have life in him. He rose from the dead so that you living in sin could call upon his name, trust in him as Lord and Savior and be his disciple. And so let me pray for you tonight as well. We've got some leaders in the room and as we pray and as I say amen, if you're here tonight and you want Jesus in your heart and life, would you go find somebody? Grab a friend by the hand maybe somebody that brought you tonight, would you grab them by the hand and say, I want to go talk to somebody. I need Jesus. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you so much for your love. Thank you for your grace tonight. God, I don't want to just be somebody who from the outside looking in, it looks like I'm a follower, but I'm really not. God, I want to be a, I want to be a biblical disciple. I want to be a, a follower of Jesus just like the one 
that you told us about tonight in Luke 14. I want to love you more than anyone else. I want to love you more than I love myself. I want to take up my cross on a daily basis and follow you. God, I want to love you more than all of my stuff. God, would you help me do that? Would you help these students do that tonight? In Jesus' name, amen.